Welcome to this sixth presentation in the course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. And this one is about the lessons we can gain from independent small nations, taking the example of East Timor. Once again, these notes are able to be downloaded online, so no need to take uh, any written notes while you're listening to this. As an overview, I will go through some of the history of the independence of East Timor, some of the neocolonial disputes that arose immediately on this country beginning to assert or reassert its independence, some of the questions around whether an oil curse exists for countries which are blessed, let's say, with a, a large amount of natural resources in the energy field, uh, some of the other uh, benefits that Timor gained through South-South cooperation with Cuba in health in particular, and then summarising on some of those broader lessons. So the key analytical question here, and which I've posed as uh, a possible essay topic for those that want to do a assessed version which, uh, of this course, which they can credit to a university, is what key factors allowed the little nation of East Timor, of Timor-Leste, as it's called officially, to regain its independence over 1999-2002, and what lessons might this have for other small nations? There are some other broader conceptual questions here, um, including in what circumstances can small nations assert their independence? Secondly, is there an oil curse? What does that really mean? How important are natural resources in the development of small nations? Another one, in what circumstances can a small nation make advances in human development? And finally, what is South-South cooperation and what advantages does it have? And you'll see readings here and also through the course notes if you want to follow up further on any of these particular themes. So a brief overview historically of the independence of East Timor, we have to look back at the early colonial period where Portugal at first um, came to, traded with, and then began to settle in and finally colonize East Timor for several centuries. Uh, the period in the mid 1970s when Portugal withdrew from East Timor and East Timor, the parties declared independence. Then the reinvasion and recolonization by Indonesia in 1975, which led to a generation long uh, second colonial period with constant popular resistance. Finally, the, uh, the Asian financial crisis, which led to an internal crisis in Indonesia, the fall of the Suharto dictatorship, a political transition in Indonesia, where there was an opportunity for East Timor to assert its uh, the fruit of its resistance and gained a referendum from the, uh, the transitional president um, over the question of special autonomy, which was rejected, and then they opted for uh, reassertion of their independence. There was a UN force led by Australia, um, several United Nations uh, transitional authorities uh, up till the, uh, the cer independence ceremony in 2002, and then after that a series of new neo-colonial disputes, um, a large number of them with its big neighbour, Australia. Looking at East Timor's colonial history, Portuguese traders arrived in, back in the early 16th century um, at this island between Asia and Melanesia, looking to trade in spices and sandalwood, for example. Um, soon after that, Dominican friars from Portugal established a, a village and a mission, and it wasn't until the early 18th century that Portugal um, purported to annex part of the island of Timor alongside the Dutch colonisation of many of the other islands in that archipelago which would later become Indonesia. So we have a situation where after more than four centuries the local people spoke Portuguese and were mostly Catholic Christians but nevertheless they maintained their own traditions or syncretic traditions let's say and culture and languages. So in other words a distinct culture to the other islands that had been colonised by the Dutch. And then in 1974, a left military coup in Portugal led to Portugal abandoning all its colonies. And that's an interesting historical juncture, which you can read about in the tremendous historical volumes by Piero Glajeses, who's written two volumes about the presence of Cuba in Africa. And along the way, he points out um, in his book, Conflicting Missions, that uh, the left military coup in Portugal happened after the one anti-colonial military resistance to Portugal uh, defeated the Portuguese army in Guinea-Bissau. 
And that broke the morale of the Portuguese army to such a degree that there was this left-wing military coup in Portugal, which led to the collapse of the then dictatorship in Portugal, and it, within a fairly short space of time, a withdrawal by Portugal from all of its colonies, including, for example, well, Guinea-Bissau, but also Mozambique and Angola and Timor. So it was in August 1975 that the Portuguese forces withdrew from Timor-Leste, then after a brief internal struggle between the different parties, the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste proclaimed its independence in November, but very soon after that Indonesian forces invaded and annexed East Timor using violent repression. Now the attitude of the Western powers, Washington privately supported the invasion. Uh, you see the headline from the New York Times here, Ford and Kissinger had bigger problems and Kissinger said, we will understand and will not press you. Uh, just don't use our weapons, basically. So the New York Times says you, the US averted its gaze. It was a little bit more of a positive green light than that. In Australia, the then Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said East Timor was, quote, not viable, unquote, as an independent nation. So there was no help from um, the Western powers um, who were in a position perhaps to do something at that time. And the resistance in Timor carried on despite that abandonment, not just abandoned by Australia and the US, but also the non-aligned movement gave little help because Indonesia was an important member of the non-aligned movement, having been a colony itself. So here we have a situation which has been repeated in some countries, like Western Sahara, for example, where a apparently independent post-colonial state recolonized another state, and then that deterred, for example, in this case, uh, Cuba, gave very little support to East Timor in that period between 1975 and 1999. It tried to compensate for that later on, recognising that problem. But Timor's resistance continued. In many areas, the resistance fighters were decimated because militarily they were no match for the very powerful uh, Indonesian army, the TNI. But popular support for independence remained very strong all that time. Nicolau Lobato, at the left in the photos above, in this slide here was the first Prime Minister from 1975 to 1978 when he was killed in action. Um, there was a National Council of Maoberi resistance. Maoberi was a word coined to talk about the indigenous people of East Timor as, as distinct from the Portuguese, for example. And in 1998, that was renamed the CNRT, the National Council of Timorese Resistance, at a meeting in Portugal. That's important because later on a political party is formed with the same acronym, the CNRT, but it's a different beast to that. There were, there were internal divisions during the, the resistance period. Commander Shanana Guismao, uh, commander in the late 80s, announced the split between Falantil, which was the resistance uh, army, the resistance militia, and the lead political party, Fretilin. And so after that, Falantil was distinct and some other uh, factions and individuals aligned themselves with Valentil, but not necessarily with Fretilin. Internationally, the support and the civil popular resistance was inflamed after a, a huge massacre of people at a, a funeral in Santa Cruz in 1991 in the capital, Dili. Uh, in 1992, Commander Guzmán was captured and held prisoner in Indonesian jails until uh, Indonesia began to withdraw in 1999. In 93, Konas Santana became the Fallon Hill commander. He was killed in action in 1998. And another very important leader um, on the right in the photos up there, David Alex, was killed in action in 1997. Now, in that period when Indonesia began to withdraw after the referendum in 1999, Fallon Hill, led by Tao Matan Ruak at that time, remained in the hills and refrained from direct intervention during the violence that was involved in that uh, the withdrawal, more or less a scorched earth policy of withdrawal by the, uh, of revenge uh, at, the, at the vote um, by the, the Timorese army and the proxy militia that they left behind. So resistance continued all that period, 24 years of Indonesian occupation until the political crisis in Indonesia ended the Suharto dictatorship and a referendum conceded by Suharto's successor, Habibi, um, took place on the 30th of August 1999. It was supervised by a United Nations body. The East Timorese people were invited to accept or reject special autonomy. And it was understood that rejection of special autonomy would mean a vote for independence. Well, there was a very 
big turnout, 97%, and in that vote, 78.5% rejected special autonomy. So that was well understood that that meant a vote for independence. The Indonesian army was directed to leave East Timor, but they left their loyalist militia, the Meraputi, the red and white, carrying the, the, the flag of loyalty to Indonesia, carried out a, a campaign of revenge, killing and burning. Enormous destruction, particularly in the capital of Dili. So in the transition period, we had, uh, first of all, a uh, this uh, United Nations mission for East Timor, which supervised the referendum, but withdrew during the post-vote violence after August 1999. Then an international force for East Timor led by Australia came in quickly because there was no time to uh, organise a new UN body at that time, but East Timorese leaders did invite this uh, interfet force to come in to try and quell the violence and stop the, the destruction um, of buildings and the killings. Um, and it was a few months later on in October 1999, uh, well only two months later on, that the UN actually created a UN transitional authority for East Timor, UNTAYET, which functioned as a trustee from October 1999 until the independence ceremony in May 2002. Now this UNTAYET, with some Timorese participation, acted as the de facto government and controlled all of the aid money until May 2002 and we see some of the, the neo-colonial problems occurring in this period. The UN also, which is to say the, the big players that were um, effectively controlling things at the UN and, and steering uh, the process, encouraged the disbanding of the National Unity Group created the, uh, in 1998, the CNRT, in favour of a multi-party system. In other words, there was a uh, pressure for the Timorese to disband their organisation of national unity in favour of a divided multi-party system which was seen as a Western model of representative democracy. So in that context elections were held in August 2001 and that led to a Fretland led coalition government. Fretland gained uh, 55 of the 88 seats at that time but there was a fair amount of coherence still. They supported the the, the later election of uh, Shanana Guzmao as the president, which was more of a nominal position, the prime minister as the, the lead uh, CEO political position in the Timorese system. And then a UN support mission remained until May 2005. So I'll show a little video of some of the comments around the time of the independence ceremony in May 2002. Uh, where you see that these ordinary Timorese people are saying that colonised people have the right to be free and just as Indonesia was free, we should be free too. You see in the ceremony Kofi Annan, the then Secretary General of the United Nations, saying to then President Shana Guzmao, independence is not an end, it is the beginning of self-rule. And then we go back to some uh, ordinary Timorese people saying that we have to manage our own land and, and environment. If not, it will be taken over by other countries or rich people. Itu punya hak untuk bisa merdeka. Makanya kami sangat sangat bangga Timur Timur bisa memperoleh suatu kemerdekaan seperti negara-negara Indonesia yang tahun 45 dijajah, tapi akhirnya bisa merdeka juga. Makanya Timur Timur juga ingin merdeka. Kami sangat berterima kasih dari entah turun bantu ya, dari UNAMED turun bantu kami untuk bisa memperoleh suatu kemerdekaan. Jadi kami sangat bangga. Terima kasih. Ya. mendukung sumber daya manusia. Kalau tidak, wilayah ini akan dikelola oleh uh, negara lain atau orang-orang kaya. Orang -orang kaya. Hmm. Sehingga ini mendukung rakyat kecil supaya bisa hidup mandiri. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Both in the transitional period and after independence, 
uh, the little nation faced a number of neo-colonial challenges, which are, of course, precisely the substance of this course, self-determination in the post-colonial world. Uh, we can summarise them, or an overview might be that they're to do with agriculture and public institutions, an internal crisis that came on a few years after independence, a long-term struggle with Australia over resource sharing and maritime boundaries, and also attempts to redefine how land is recognised and registered effectively. So I'll come to these each in turn. The first one is East Timor's agricultural dispute with the World Bank. Now this is rather significant because East Timor is a little country with very degraded land which has had serious and chronic problems of food insecurity and so the way in which agriculture is managed and the way in which the uh, society supports agriculture, uh, particularly through a, a period called the hungry season, a very long dry season, is significant in terms of key security features for the population. So over that transitional period from 1999 to 2002, Timorese leaders saw as urgent the need to restore agriculture and grain production which had been damaged in particular during the transition crisis and the, the violence after the referendum. They wanted to use aid money that was then coming in to rebuild rice fields, to rebuild public grain silos, public agricultural service centres and public abattoirs. But the World Bank entrusted by UNTAYAT with the aid money and also some of the aid donors like the Australian Aid Agency for example were ideologically against this idea. So despite the fact that they adopted the language of self-rule they refused these requests saying that the government should not own revenue generating enterprises such as meat slaughterhouses, warehouse facilities and grain storage facilities because this would inhibit private sector entrepreneurship said the IDA which is a sub-branch of the World Bank. So this was uh, a conflict that arose when the UN agency was uh, acting as de facto government and there was, still was not a recognised Timorese leadership there. But the Timorese remember that the World Bank under Indonesian rule had backed forced sterilisation programs of schoolgirls, transmigration of other migrants to, uh, to the island which was seen as a form of watering down the resistance. Um, and the TNI backed militias, the Indonesian army, all of which were seen as hostile. So they really regarded the World Bank's role in the past as being a part of the Indonesian colonial system, if not a genocidal policies. Now, after independence, the Timorese government did try and, try and create partial food security. They went back to their process of trying to restore uh, rice production, for example. So if you look at the table at the bottom there, it shows that um, with a big collapse in rice production, for example, um, and also uh, in corn, in maize, and also in cassava and other uh, root vegetables, um, there was a restoration of that production by 2004. Unfortunately, that all collapsed again with the internal crisis in 2006. Food security uh, in East Timor had peculiar features. Um, the, the chronic food insecurity has been due to, one, the political upheavals and the colonial period and the transitions between colonial periods, b, the sharp seasonal changes with a very long five, sometimes six month hungry season or dry season, a drought, and c, a degraded environment, limited arable land and food import dependence. So there'd been a lot of deforestation in the colonial period, both for the um, the trade in sandalwood and then the Indonesian military cutting down trees to try and remove the cover that the guerrilla fighters were using during the resistance period. Now a sustainable development goal of the UN announced in 2015 stresses ending hunger and ensuring food access for all, ending all forms of malnutrition as linked to that doubling agricultural productivity. In other words, local agricultural production is seen as linked to food security in the UN uh, model of things not in big uh, agricultural grain exporting countries like my own, like Australia, where um, food security is seen to be linked to trade. But most countries in practice want to ground their food security, their staple food production, uh, staple food consumption in their local production. But East Timor's food production had always been low. They'd always depended to some degree on imported rice, for example. They wanted to minimise that, basically. 
So undernourishment uh, did fall sharply after independence, but it remained very high at more than 30%, as you can see from this 2020 graph at the right there. Land and neoliberal land reform. Um, this uh, I'll touch on more in the following week's uh, discussion of customary land in Mel the Melanesian Islands. But in Timor, the constitution created uh, by popular consultation in 2001 specified that only Timor-Leste natural persons can own land. That means neither corporations nor foreigners can own land. However, as in a number of other countries, the big powers set out to find ways around this. First of all, USAID became the USAID agency became Timor's lead agency on land reform with a land law program in 2004 and then a framework for transitional land law. Now Australia's aid program, AusAid, had done a lot of uh, this so-called land reform in the Southeast Asian region, but in this case USAID took the lead. The initial special regime, which was adopted as a law by the Republic in 2009, was really mainly to deal with land disputes arriving from overlapping uh, colonial regimes, that is to say some titles were set up in the Portuguese regime, changed under the Indonesian regime, they weren't properly uh, recognised and later on people were claiming land that had been taken from them in previous regimes. So at that stage the special regime on land um, excluded customary rural land which however was uh, the big prize in the minds of the big uh, foreign investors for example and USAID and Australian aid both have a history of pushing cadastral mapping, that is to say, first of all, trying to map in GPS the mapping these days on, on maps, the boundaries of land, creating centralised registers for the purpose of parcelising and commercialising rural land, selling it off, uh, often to foreign-owned monoculture cropping. This is a chronic and wide-scale uh, issue in Southeast Asia and both USAID in, in many countries in Latin America, in the Middle East, Australian aid in, in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia have been involved in this type of um, opening up and commercialising land or allowing land to be capitalised, as they say it, for these large monoculture crop projects. But in a country with chronic food security programs, agrofuel projects and monocultures are being pressed by the foreign investors and there was resistance to this. Uh, in one case, a domestic land reform, uh, land network, Rede Barai, was set up to defend traditional land culture and also traditional land care, or Tarabandu, that is to say, with traditional land tenure, that is to say, where communities have land and they allocate land to members of those communities in a traditional way, and that uh, allocation is then passed on through generations without it being commercialised and sold off. Associated with that is a traditional land care where the maintenance of the fertility of that land and the, the utility of that land through customary practices, um, that is to say customary forms of fertilisation and customary forms of irrigation, which are not the same as uh, modernistic large-scale uh, technologies, for example, take place. Now, I mentioned that land had been degraded under both the Portuguese and the Indonesian occupations, and then uh, in the 21st century, still over 70% of the population of Timor-Leste depended on land for their livelihoods and the vast majority of land was governed by these customary mechanisms which had been excluded in the, in the initial land regime law. But there was a process underway. And the Redebarai was there to try and defend that traditional tenure and traditional uh, uh, land care. Thirdly, there, is this, uh, there was this very long maritime oil and gas dispute with Australia. Now, this had its own history in the Indonesian colonial period. In 1989, Australia signed a treaty with Indonesia to share East Timor's seabed resources. In the top right there, you see the foreign ministers of Australia and Indonesia at that time celebrating with champagne in a plane overflying East Timor the way that they're going to carve up the oil and gas resources of that little country. Uh, they created a shared zone to try and carve up the divisions and then when uh, independence came to East Timor in 2002, Australia simply moved uh, that shared zone agreement onto the newly recognised state of East Timor. At the same time, they withdrew from a dispute resolution process under international law and tried to limit the extent to which the new uh, body politic in Timor could really adjust or, or uh, contest that arrangement there. So there was a series of agreements 
um, around the time of independence, a separate agreement over the Sunrise Field, which was on the border of the so-called shared area. Uh, and then there was another agreement in 2006, which ended in 2018. And it was only in 2018 that Australia finally agreed, under the pressure of UN legal conciliation, um, to agree to maritime boundaries. So in other words, that very long period from the late 80s, but in particular from independence, 16 years after independence, uh, of pressure on the Australians, a significant exercise of political will by the little nation of Timor-Leste, uh, Australia finally agreed to maritime boundaries where, of course, they had a much greater access to their own oil and gas resources than had been allowed under this so-called Joint Petroleum Development Area. And the NGO Lahamutuk in, in Timor commented in this way in 2018, Australia withdrew from international maritime boundary dispute resolution processes two months before Timor-Leste became independent in 2002 to avoid legal accountability. However, they overlooked a never used mechanism in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, which had been ratified by Australia and by Timor-Leste later on. So this dispute really um, damaged relations or put a lot of strain on relations between the newly independent East Timor and the, its big neighbour Australia. And that became a factor in the internal crisis or coup of 2006. What happened there was there was a leadership challenge by the President, Shanana Gusmao, who dissatisfied with being more of a titular leader as president, with the power really resting in the hands of the elected Prime Minister, Fretland leader Murray al -Kattiri. Um Shanana really presided over, without directly uh, admitting responsibility for, an armed insurrection led by Alfredo Renato, a renegade guerrilla fighter who helped force the Prime Minister Murray al -Kattiri from office. Now, this is a dispute that deserves a little scrutiny. And the role of Australia is rather important because at that time, the Australian elite, and by that I mean the government, the corporate media, for example, also some of the leading NGOs, were beginning to regard the Fretland-led government as an opponent to Australia because of this, uh, largely because of this oil and gas dispute. But remember, there was also ideological differences over the, the way in which the team Rees would develop public institutions to support their agriculture. So they accused Fretland of being Mozambique Marxists and communists and unsympathetic to the type of Western democracy that Australia wanted uh, Timor to abide by. So in that armed insurrection context where there was a, a degree of violence, um, uh, a number of killings, there was another Australian military intervention, again invited by Team Rees leaders but under great pressure, uh, ostensibly for stabilisation but favouring the Gusmao side of the dispute because Canberra felt Gusmao might be easy to deal with over the oil disputes. Now many thousands of people were displaced internally in this violence. Shanana Gusmao took over as Prime Minister at a time when oil revenues were beginning to flow in and uh, after that we'll talk about the corruption issues that began to rock the government there. But let's stay with the, the conflict for a moment. Australia at this time in 2006 presented itself as a mediator, um, but in doing that they ran, the Australian media ran baseless stories about Prime Minister Murray al -Kattiri, which had been put up by the insurgents basically in Timor, by the political opponents, and they were used, those allegations, not proven, were used to force him to resign as Australian troops were invited in to help quell the coup-like violence at that time. And here's a transcript from ABC, the late Elizabeth Jackson on Australia's ABC, saying that there were, she says, disturbing new allegations against East Timor's embattled Prime Minister Murray al -Kattiri, that he had uh, engaged a group of armed civilians who shot and bashed four people who were organising peaceful protests, and worse than that, that he had uh, forces loyal to him had carried out a massacre of 60 unarmed protesters in April and dumped their bodies in a mass grave. Now this went on to be a major documentary uh, by the, the ABC, um, which was entirely baseless. A UN report uh, a few months later on found that no massacre occurred at all. But nevertheless, on the basis of those media reports, the, uh, the pressure was, was placed on Murray al to resign. And indeed, 
the president, Shenanakwa Smao, took a video recording of the ABC documentary and slammed it on his desk, apparently, as part of the pressure to get Alkatiri to resign. Now, <clears throat> this was uh, a serious problem internally for Timor because the new internal divisions allowed an intervention by Australia that had a far more partisan uh, character than the intervention of 1999, where Australia was called in unexpectedly at the, at the last moment to um, effectively pull, uh, peacekeep as the, as the uh, Indonesian forces withdrew and uh, their proxies were disarmed at the time. On this occasion, the Australian intervention was linked to a series of demands from the Australian side. Now, apart from the oil and gas dispute, which was central and which was about effectively Australian leadership demanding privileged access to oil and gas resources in the Timor Sea, an Australian elite in politics, in the media, in the corporate media and in some sectors of the NGO were demanding reform of Fretilin, the party, abolition of Timor-Leste's army and adoption of the English language, which wasn't an official language. The official languages, the main official languages were Portuguese and Tetum, although English was a working language. None of those demands were met, but it's important to recognise that this was the type of thinking that came out into the open at a time of crisis like this. And after the crisis, the body politic remained divided, with Shenanakwa Smao leading a coalition of minor parties against what had been the historic independence party, Fretilin. Fretilin remained the major party in Parliament, but Shanaqua Smao, as the historic leader of the resistance, managed to put together a coalition of independents and minor parties to hold on to government for the next three elections. He borrowed, uh, Shanana borrowed the acronym, uh, the CNRT, of the National Council of Timorese Resistance to form a new party called the National Congress for Timorese Reconstruction, so borrowing on the, on the goodwill of that, that name. But in this case, it wasn't a national unity organisation. It was a party set up specifically to oppose Fretilin. So with the country divided, uh, there were a number of problems. But sufficient will remain to confront Australia over the oil and gas dispute. If Australia thought that Gusmao was going to be easy to roll over on the oil and gas dispute, that didn't happen. But there were sharp divisions over long-term investment of petroleum resources which had a limited lifespan. So there were internal problems that were very important. Here's one quote from a senior Australian journalist, part of the Murdoch Media stable uh, at the time, that uh, Paul Kelly said, uh, Shanana Gusmao and Ramos Horta, the then Foreign Minister, are pro-Australian and cognizant of working with Canberra. By contrast, the Howard government, the Conservative government at that time, sees Alcatiri as a 1970s style pro-Marxist anti-capitalist. Pro-Marxist because they wanted to hold on to state-controlled oil and gas resources and they wanted public institutions to support their agriculture. Well, that brings us to the, the third topic, the idea of an oil curse, which has been popularly applied to Timor because indeed a large number of problems uh, opened up as a result of the, the influx of a large amount of oil and oil revenue basically, and the use of that oil revenue. So oil for Timor-Leste was central to internal as well as external problems. Now, theoretically, um, the background to this is that we have a number of theories. One is called staple theory, which was developed in Canada, applied to Australia, which speaks of national resor uh, natural resources as being a leading sector which can help a nation develop. Uh, putting aside the questions of colonisation in Canada and Australia, you've got countries that gained access to a large amount of land from taking them from indigenous people, but then with those large resources, what is the role of that uh, uh, dividend, let's say, of natural resources? Is it going to make the country not uh, industrialise or develop other capacities? Is it going to make it lazy, relying on its natural resources? Or is it going to be a leading sector which is going to drive ahead the development of those other forms of economic activity? That was the the staple theory which was used to put a positive light on the large land, in particular the land resources of Canada and Australia after colonisation. In Timor, the question of the oil curse, a couple of theories associated with this idea of the oil curse were thrown around. One side of it is a rather technical economic explanation called Dutch disease which is talking about 
relative prices, changes in relative prices which crowd out or compete with non-oil commerce, that is to say there's, it's not favourable to engage in non-oil industries because um, you're getting a much better return on your oil sector. Or another way of putting the same thing, rent seeking, which is reliance on non-productive extractivism um, and leading to corruption. Um, these theories, this idea of an oil curse, looks less kindly on the idea of factor endowment, which staple theory had elevated. But the oil curse idea also says that countries which are very rich in petroleum have less democracy, less economic stability and more frequent civil wars. So conflict, internal problems, not really, not stability and not strong development, um, and also uh, corruption. But the counter-argument, or let's say a review of the literature by Dijon, not exactly a counter-argument, but he's looking at historical evidence to say that while you've got these sorts of problems, they are not curse in the sense of inevitable. Um, it depends on governance and state capacity. So in other words, the extent of those sorts of problems depends on political will and organisation and whether there is um, you know, some uh, political will, state capacity, um, response to those uh, opportunities but also vulnerabilities. So there's, De John is really saying it's not an inevitable process. But nevertheless we see you know, the, the downside, the, the defects of that um, reliance, initial reliance on oil, which is quite extreme in East Timorese case because very quickly it became the case that a large majority of state budget came from petroleum revenue. Um, not in the first few years but after the first few years that happened. And that was foreseen. So in 2005 a petroleum fund law was created in East Timor based on Article 139 of the Constitution which says that the petroleum fund should be owned by the state and shall be used in a fair and equitable manner in accordance with national interests and establishing mandatory financial reserves. The idea of the law then was to set up a process where the government is supposedly, uh, in an advisory sense, using um, the revenue that is earned by the invested funds so that a, a relatively short term uh, large amount of money earned over revenues over let's say 10 or 15 or 20 years can be, the revenues can be stretched over, out over many more years. So this is what's called generically a sovereign wealth fund. It exists in many countries. There are some you know, good examples of it. One of the better examples cited was the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund um, and you know, there were some comparisons going on there, but the idea in general is frowned on by private bankers and other neoliberals because, as we know, the preference of neoliberals and the banking system is to try and get the private sector involved in those things and have the profit motive driving um, those sorts of developments and being able to harvest private benefit from those sorts of resources. So the petroleum fund idea to invest funds and use those returns for budgetary purposes. In law, there were always except, uh, exceptions, and the exceptions were regulated in a way where, of course, the, the government and the parliament could deviate from the suggested use of funds, and they did in fact. So they didn't prevent, the, the petroleum fund law and advisory bodies didn't prevent the governments from overdrawing. Indeed, contracts from oil money and in particular for infrastructure and in particular for mega projects, large infrastructure projects, became a key medium of corruption in East Timor. And an anti-corruption commission was set up, but it didn't really have power. It could only observe and report on some of these sorts of things. There were some uh, notorious cases. A former justice minister was jailed over corruption. There were corruption claims linked to Shanana Gusmao himself. But this large influx of oil money, let's say, was not well handled. And here's a graph um, also from the NGO Lahamutuk showing that there was a huge and temporary dependence on oil and gas revenues and so um, it illustrates the fiscal vulnerability of the new republic that really over a period of um, about 15 years there's this in influx of oil and gas revenue. This is the productive fields at that time. It excludes future income from the development of the Greater Sunrise gas field. That is something that will come on later on, but will also, of course, have a, a limited lifespan, basically. But you see in this graph that there's a peak where a lot of oil is coming in, and really we're already at the point where uh, they're well past that, that peak of 
influx of oil and gas revenues. There's a reference to the Lahamuntuk site, which has a long string of, uh, of uh, articles on the history, the recent history of the, the oil and gas issue. Now, one of the effects of the large influx, uh, influx of income beginning in around about 2006, um, at the same time as the internal crisis occurs, is that you have a huge rise in gross domestic product. That is to see the economy of the country is expanding enormously. If you look between 2006, 2009 and 2000, uh, sorry, 2006, 2007, 2007, 2008, you have gross domestic product growth of over 20%. Now, in any international terms, that's considered wonderful. Uh, it's considered that you know the, the the economic theorists say this is the key to uh, social well-being, large amount of GDP growth. But of course, a lot of other conditions have to be taken into account here. And I raise some questions here for people to consider analytically. They're more or less rhetorical questions because they're things that should that deserve some sort of study. Economic growth is often said to be very important. But do these strong figures mean that the country developed just because there was strong economic growth? We know it came from one source, largely. Uh, if the country did develop, um, how might the country develop from such growth? In other words, let's assume that there is this big influx of funds, but how is that going to be of benefit to the people as a whole? And how might such growth, growth not assist development? What are the downsides to that? big growth in, in GDP. I'm going to leave those questions in the air because they're bigger questions that apply to many other circumstances. Here is uh, a graph, a, a table which shows some quite important um, data from the UNDP. And it's a, uh, it's a measure of gross national income, which is Another way of talking about gross domestic product, it's a little technically it's a little bit different, but it's about economic growth minus the human development index rank. Now the human development index rank is uh, comprises income, education and health in the for education in the form of years of schooling and adult literacy and health in the forms of life expectancy, life expectancy at birth. So two important qualifiers to it just being the same as income, but income is included in HDI too. And why this figure is important is because it shows us really the relative efficiency of a nation uh, in using its resources to improve its health and education, for example, because HDI embodies uh, strong measures of health and education. So one thing to notice about this table is, that this is from 2012, is that none of the best performers on the left, that is to say those who have an HDI rank that is much higher than you would expect for their income, none of them have large oil resources. But almost all of the worst performers on the right side of the table do. Um, now what does that tell us? An inevitability about the oil curse, it shows us a vulnerability about countries that have a lot of oil uh, or a lot of natural resources. So uh, it's uh, be careful about calling it an oil curse, but nevertheless you can see some serious patterns here. Now in the case of, well let me explain that a little bit more. The negative figures on the right hand side mean the country has greater income than overall HDI. The positive figures, mean, this is at the bottom, mean that the country's overall human development index is better than its income. So the positive figures on the left show better use of income for human development. The negative figures show a relative waste of income. So maybe there's improvement in health and education in these countries on the right, but not in relation to the amount of income they have. And this is important, I think, because it shows us that income may be correlated to better standards of living, but there are significant uh, exceptions, really big exceptions. If you look at the difference between, say, Cuba and Equatorial Guinea, a huge gap between their income and their human development there. Now in the case of East Timor, uh, its uh, rank in 2005 was plus 16. It was in the left hand column there in plus 16 just three years after independence. In other words, in the early years of Timor's independence it was making quite an efficient use of its income. What, the income was very low, but there were significant improvements in life expectancy and kids going to school, adult literacy. There were 
big improvements there in relation to its very limited income. By 2012, when you've got quite a number of years of oil revenues coming in, inflating the country's um, national income, the uh, GNI minus HDI rank had fallen down to minus 29. Uh, into the right column there with Trinidad and Tobago. But by 2019, it was back up to plus three. Now, how do we explain this? Well, one possible explanation is that an influx of oil revenues after 2006, 2007 inflated national income, but it didn't flow onto social benefits for some years later on, relative social benefits later on. Let's look at some more updated figures and see what we can uh, find about what was happening in East Timor. First of all, the public sector budget as proportions of investment, we can see some weakness here in terms of how money is being spent. Now, if there was to be a very big push in education, we would expect this to be a large proportion of the budget used in education. There are a number of well-performing countries that use 20% or more of their budget for education. Timor was using 14.9, 13.4% in the early years, but later on it fell to 10 or 11%. Now, that's not the worst on earth, but it's not also the best. It's not going to achieve the very high aims that they had. Uh, there was a strategic development report, which was talking about getting all kids to finish year 12 by a certain time. You know, 10% of your budget is not going to do that. You need a much bigger investment than that. Similarly with healthcare, healthcare was, 12, 11, 12% in the early years, fell down to 7% by 2010. So not a big commitment there, despite the fact that there is this big uh, training of doctors program going on with the Cubans. Agriculture, even worse in a way that fallen from almost 9% in the early years after independence to less than 4% by 2010. So a relative neglect of agriculture, but if you look at the line below agriculture in the left table there, infrastructure, a huge expenditure on infrastructure, more than a quarter of the budget on infrastructure, supposedly going into roads and bridges and water and things like that. But nevertheless, as I mentioned before, infrastructure projects are one of those big sources of corruption everywhere in the world, whether it's legal corruption, whether it's illegal corruption, but nevertheless, those huge contracts are where big corporations come in and cream people basically, you know, do bad work for big money, basically. So there was a problem with priorities there. And if you look at um, a bit closer there, you'll see that the oil revenues allowed those big budgets, allowed investment in infrastructure. Indeed, the Shenan led governments were talking about a priority to infrastructure, but agriculture, education and health were being neglected. And the low schooling rates were characterized as um, a chapter in the UNDP report in 2018 said were characterized by a large gender gap, which has its costs in health, family planning and labor productivity. Um, on the other side, this prioritized investment in infrastructure really neglected a strong case that should have been made for greater investment in people. So in outcomes, to compare Timor-Leste in this period, um, you know, in the first decade and a half after independence, we do see um, a growth in, in life expectancy. Um, if you look at the bottom right table there from 1999, when the Indonesian army was uh, forced out, you see life expectancy growing from 56 to 68.5 in 2015. So 15 years, one and a half decades, you've got a 12 and a half year increase in life expectancy. It's really significant. It's a, a significant advance. And a lot of that has to do with the, uh, the health of children. That is to say, if children are dying young, that's the big factor that crashes average life expectancy in a country. So if children are being looked after better, if children and mothers, then you're going to have this uh, significant impact on life expectancy. It's not about adults just getting to 56 or 60 or 60, 62. It's about many children dying and dragging that average down. Um, on the other hand, look at the relative weak years of school and adult literacy. Um, in the bottom, you see that um, they've gone from mean years of schooling from 2.8, which is extremely low, to 2015, 4.4. It's improved but it hasn't improved a lot. Look at the table on the left there, mean years of schooling in 2015, 4.4, but the average in developing countries 
is 6.8. So well below the average of kids going to school. Um, high levels of malnutrition. This is a chronic problem, as I said, with the food security history of East Timor. Um, and on the other hand, of course, it's recognized in the, in the literature and it was spelt out in that um, UNDP report in 2018 on to do with youth and, and development in Timor, that there are these well recognized benefits of strong education for girls and women in particular. Uh, it benefits which impact on economic growth, on women's wages and jobs, on the lives of children and mothers, on the smaller, more sustainable families, on healthier, well-educated children, um, in, uh, improving disease, reducing child marriage and so on. So a range of benefits which are well recognized, but not being realized with these very low levels of schooling still in, in Timor. Finally, on the outcomes here, here's something more up to date, the, the human development advances uh, up to 2019. There have been some strong advances in health, as I mentioned, infant mortality also falling. Girls attending some part of secondary school, as the graph on the right shows, but not really, uh, that's a little bit misleading because it doesn't tell us how many years in school the girls are completing. The 2020 UNDP report shows that Timor-Leste has fallen 12 ranks over 2014 and 2019. And if we look back at the advances in the first decade from 2000 to 2010, we see much stronger improvements. So that was not a period of higher income. Uh, the income was not associated with stronger improvements in human development there. And these mean years of schooling, although they're now up to 4.8 from 4.4, they're still well below developing country averages. So some significant challenges that Timor faces. Now, finally, this is a, um, a better news story about the South-South cooperation between Timor-Leste and Cuba. This is an interesting example because while the Cubans have been training doctors around the world in many, many countries, indeed, they're the biggest single trainers of doctors in the world, even though Cuba is a small country, they had not engaged with Timor in the resistance period under Indonesia precisely because, in my view, the Cuba and in Indonesia were both very strong leading members of the non-aligned movement. And it was not convenient for Cuba at that time to have a confrontation with Indonesia over the colonization of the Little Island. But at one of the meetings with Fidel Castro, I've been told one of the participants there said that there was an element of uh, uh, from Fidel Castro saying that perhaps we should have done more to help Timor in the past. So there was some element of compensation going on there. The, the program began with a meeting between Shinana Guzmao and Fidel Castro at an online meeting in Kuala Lumpur in 2003, the fir an offer of 20 scholarships. The those first students went to Cuba um, the following year. The first Cuban doctors came to East Timor. In 2005, the scholarship offer rose from, to, from 20 to 300. And then at the end of the year in December, when this picture on the right was taken and the meeting between Fidel Castro and Mario Alcateri, the scholarship number was raised to 1000. And the rationale to that was that Cuba was looking at what Timor needed to uh, equip or staff its entire health system with a population of around 1 million at that time. The calculation was you need at least a doctor per 1000 people. So Cuba was really not doing more than just a, a decent aid program. Uh, training 20 doctors was a, was a decent program. This was about trying to equip and staff the entire health system of East Timor. And at that time, at Independence, Timor had only about 70 or so doctors. Then during the crisis, the students kept traveling to Cuba despite the coup at home. And in 2007, a medical faculty was set up in Dili as a collaboration between Timor-Leste and Cuba, initially with Cuban professors and later bringing in some Timorese uh, professors as well. The first graduates began in the capital in Dili. None of them graduated in Cuba. They graduated with a Timorese certificate in East Timor, uh, the first group in 2010. In 2012, the largest graduation occurred of more than 400 who graduated in Dili. And by 2020, uh, they'd between them they'd met the the commitment to train more than a thousand doctors that is to say the the dedication of the students the uh 
the will of the, of the Cuban system to keep that training going. By the way, initially, this was entirely a gift by Cuba, but when the oil and gas revenue came in, then Cuba asked that their doctors in Timor be paid their salaries. That's Timorese level salary, not a Western level salary in Timor. So there was some level of compensation for that program when at about 2011, when the, the, the Timorese state had the budget to sustain it. Now, today, most of those are employed. There's been some delays. There's been um, frustrating delays in, um, in employing them all. But most of them these days, uh, I would say at least 85 percent, perhaps 90 percent now, are employed as salaried public sector doctors. And that's another important factor. Uh, very few of them have actually left the country and very few of them have left to go into private practice. Um, so salaried public sector doctors, something that barely exists in, say, the American system and doesn't exist to a very large extent in the Australian system either. But nevertheless, that ethos of a doctor serving the public and having a salary and not being a business person trying to make as much money as you can out of health, that ethos has been passed across in this system. So there's a concept called social medicine, which I suggest has been applied in Timor. And I, I've written about this in an article called Social Medicine in Timor, 2010. And the former health minister, former one of the former prime ministers, Rui Araujo, has written about it also in an article in 2009. Social medicine is a concept which uh, has a European tradition, but in the Latin American tradition, it involves active participation. Um, now, the European tradition speaks in a more epidemiological sense of the social determinants of health, that is to say, social factors influence people's health, whereas the Latin American tradition goes a step further and says that the patients should be know about their health, they should be informed, they should be educated, and they should begin to, act, to participate actively in their own health. And you see this, you'll see it in the video that's coming up, that the, the first batch of uh, doctors in Timor were stressing that sort of participation um, as opposed to simply uh, being experts providing medicine to people who turn up at their clinic. I mentioned that the training of students commenced in Cuba and perhaps uh, several hundred of them were trained in Cuba, but they came back to finish off their training to do their internship in, in their home country and to graduate from the Faculty of Medicine that was created in the capital of Dili. All of the graduations occurred in Timor-Leste. The development of social medicine in Timor, of course, involves the synthesis of Timorese values, Timorese humanist values, Timorese Christian values, the strong sense of community that maintained the resistance of Timor through the colonial periods. And it has certain advantages that were very large scale training. So there's a large group of young people who were supporting each other to develop a system which would improve the health of their communities and not simply to go into business and make a good career for themselves. There was a sympathetic culture, uh, sympathetic as between, uh, let's say, Cuban humanism and Christian communitarianism in, in Timor. And there was sufficient political will, at least, despite the disunity and despite the conflicts at home for that program to go ahead. Dr. Rui Araujo has said that the medical training of the Timorese emphasized responsibility to society, critical thinking, flexibility and openness to knowledge exchange with a focus on the health of individuals, families and communities and not just the disease of individuals. So a system that was about health and promoting health and not just about curing disease. So in this video, um, which is a bit over four minutes long, this is from a set of interviews with the first group of Timorese students trained by the Cubans in Cuba but returning for their internship and then their graduation in 2010. That group of 18, which was the initial 20, minus a couple that were held back and or put into other courses, they were trained in clin clinical, epidemiological and social medicine, as the Cuban Dean, first Dean of the Faculty of Medicine points out in this video. Notice the stresses that they make on preventive medicine, visiting people in their own homes, health education and the active partic participation of patients. So these doctors, now, at the time of this presentation, I've worked as professionals for more than a decade, and most of them have done specialist studies already. Yeah. 
posible para, para alcanzar nuestro sueño, ¿no? Que hemos luchando y ahora ya que estamos obteniendo nuestra mano, hay que sacrificar, luchar y hacerlo con, con mucha confianza y fe, con amor como por ejemplo el objetivo de nosotros, ¿no? primero la promoción, promoción hacer la uh, charla edu educativa, hacerle llegar a, la, sus, a sus conocimientos para que ellos puedan, uh, puedan adaptar, para que ellos uh, tengan un una conocimiento acerca de, de sí mismo y acerca de su ambiente y al fin, uh, al fin para prevenir y si hay en uh, caso de la, las enfermedades que ellos tienen, nosotros pod uh, podemos llegar a precozmente, ¿no? precozmente a, des, a descubrir su enfermedad y de ahí nosotros vamos a, a lograr a curar lo, las enfermedades. Es, no es cuestión de, de llevar medicina, de dar los medicamentos nada más a ellos, sino de enseñarlos, de enseñarlos cómo ellos mismos pueden combatir la enfermedad. Porque para mí el simple hecho de lavar la mano un aroma puede prevenir muchas enfermedades, pero aquí la población no saben es enseñarlo a que ellos mismos puede ser el participar activo ellos mismos participan de forma activa en la prevención de las enfermedades por ejemplo yo en UCI muchas poblaciones viven en lugares muy remotos y nosotros estamos tratando a que ellos por ejemplo no paren en el centro de salud pero cómo si ellos viven en monte que es muy difícil a llegar ahí entonces Además, ellos con nivel de conocimiento muy bajo, ellos, simple, ellos simplemente piensan que no, es mejor yo paro en la casa. Pero después de eso sube, sale complicaciones y, y, y muchos problemas. ¿no? Yo creo que eh, nosotros, para mí, el, el tiempo que pasé allá estudié en Cuba, sí aprendí algo. Sí aprendí algo y estoy listo para ayudar a mi pueblo. Pero ¿cómo? Estamos tratando de esto. ¿Cómo? Porque yo, mi visión es, no es... No es sentar en una oficina esperando a que la, eh, los enfermos lleguen a mí diciendo que estoy enfermo de esto sino nosotros como nos enseñaba en Cuba es llegarle a ellos primero en la casa viendo cómo está viviendo cómo, cómo está eh, llevando sus vidas diarias qué comen por ejemplo eh, si está bañando o no El sistema de formación del médico cubano tiene eh, eh, parte de un modelo tradicional que tuvo una, una prevalencia de más de 40 años, que ha ido perfeccionándose con flexibilidad en su currículo hacia una medicina que más que curativa es preventiva. Para lograr que la medicina sea más preventiva que curativa hay que involucrar en ese proceso no solo al médico o al equipo de salud o al sistema de salud, sino a la sociedad, a las comunidades, al, a otros sistemas dentro de un país, pudiéramos decir el educacional, la parte del deporte o, o la parte económica o del transporte, porque la salud pública no se sustenta solo en un proceder médico, sino que tiene que estar sustentado en todo un macrosistema de proceso. Ese es el enfoque eh, más o menos en síntesis que tiene la medicina cubana. Es decir, no es solo eh, médica o no solo se practica el método clínico, sino que en la formación el estudiante debe ser capaz de aplicar el método clínico, epidemiológico y además social. Ellos explican mucho, preguntan mucho y explicar mucho al, al paciente para que ellos, el paciente, pueda entender qué enfermedad que tiene, que tiene y cómo hacer para curar. Entonces, eh, el diálogo entre, entre eh, médico y paciente a veces dura eh, una hora o media hora o una hora. The training and deployment of a large body of salaried health workers, um, in this case mainly doctors, is a very important element of social medicine and the construction of a Timorese social medicine. Another feature of East Timor social medicine can be seen in Dr. Andre Bello's volunteer organization, Sabe, Saude Ba Emahotu, Health for Everyone, established in 2018 with the support of Dr. Rui Araujo, the former health minister and prime minister. Um, Bello says we've had 
379 volunteers work with us over the years. This is a group that goes out into very remote areas and provides health care for people in neglected areas. He says they are medical graduates who have not yet employed full time. So a lot of the um, graduates, doctor graduates, waiting around to get their employment. Uh, in this case, he says 179 of them, almost half of them had gained work since they started. But nevertheless, he's, he's making use of trained people who were waiting to get into the system. So um, the, the journalist that was writing about this, Alex Ray, was saying that in addition to English, Portuguese and Tetum, he discovered that nearly all of them spoke Spanish because most of them were trained by Cuban medical professors who'd been working in Timor-Leste since 2004. So this Health for Everyone, taking volunteers out into remote rural areas is another important element of this good news story of the development of a social medicine in East Timor and certainly something that underlies the, uh, the success of Timor in extending lifespans, in making sure that children survive, in trying to ensure that mothers survive childbirth, for example. So we can sum up on this that over small nations, um, the so-called lost causes of the world and independence dilemmas, an independent East Timor, which was recolonized in 1975 and which many thought was a lost cause, basically because the forces against them were so big, the US was against them, Australia wouldn't support them, Indonesia was a huge nation and Indonesia had solidarity from many other um, non-aligned countries apart from the Western countries. But it was considered a lost cause until its moment came. And we might reflect also on the fact that the Western Sahara, which was recolonized by Morocco in 1975, Palestine colonized by the Zionist Europeans in 1948. These lost causes also have some future. And what lessons might there be for them in the experience of East Timor? Well, I suggest that the key elements for East Timor's independence were, first of all, at the core, a sustained resistance, something that was maintained over a long period of time with large scale popular support. It wasn't going to be um, diverted or driven away or deflected into some other area. That's the most important thing. The other thing, relative unity, relative unity, despite the divisions during the resistance period after independence, enough unity to maintain the support for independence and then also to maintain the national position against Australia when it came to the oil and gas disputes. And then the right opportunities, that is say an internal crisis in the coloniser, which weakened uh, the coloniser and created an opening effectively where the, um, the successor president in this case, who'd been an official in the former regime, but nevertheless wanting to distinguish himself from the former regime, suggested this idea of a referendum on special autonomy uh, recognising that rejection would mean that the East Timorese were going to maintain their claim for independence. So I think they're important generic features to notice about this particular history. The neo-colonial dilemmas, first of all, this new body politic from the very beginning in the transitional phase faced challenges over agriculture, over the creation of public institution, which was opposed by the neoliberal institutions, in particular the World Bank and its backers, the pressure to commercialise land, which is something that's in, in the long haul effectively because there is a natural, very strong uh, popular resistance at the ground level amongst people who benefit from community land. And then some organisations like Rue Barai were set up to create uh, uh, support for, organised support for uh, traditional land and traditional land care. And then of course, in the question of oil resources, there was a long uh, period 16 years after the independence ceremony where uh, it, it took that long for the East Timorese to um, succeed in their claim for defined maritime boundaries with their big uh, chauvinistic neighbour, Australia. The political divisions, particularly after 2006, sapped political will, allowed corruption over oil revenues, but sufficient will was maintained to confront Australia on the oil and gas issue, the maritime boundary issue. And uh, also the oil curse, while not inevitable, certainly was an area of vulnerability. We see a lapse in terms of the progress that Timor was making after independence when uh, a large flood of money came in and was put to a range of nefarious purposes, apart from being invested apparently rather efficiently on infrastructure projects and 
um, failing priorities in the area, important areas of education, health and agriculture, notwithstanding the advances in education, notwithstanding the advances in health um, in no small part to that large South-South cooperation. That South-South cooperation with Cuba in health, the development of new forms of social medicine with a Timorese character was one area of outstanding success and that emphasised the value of non-colonial relations or to say more equitable relations with other international partners and investing in human resources as opposed to relying on natural resources. That's an important theme which I think we should pick up on later in this course. So finally, once again, for some further reading, um, I suggest these books might be of interest. There's a book by Frederick Durand on the history of East Timor. There is a, uh, a history of the Timorese resistance from Constancio Pinto and Matthew Jardine. There is a, a compilation of chapters on the politics of Timor-Leste edited by Michael Leach and Damien Kingsbury. And then there's a book by lawyer Bernard Collery on the dispute between Australia and East Timor over the oil and gas, which uh, created some very uh, unusual subplots, which I won't go into now. Nevertheless, these things might be of interest. 